He is considered one of the best imports to ever play in the Philippine Basketball Association, holding the highest number of points and rebounds of all time. He's a two-time champion and two-time Best Import Awardee during his days as an active player. He added 11 more championships when he became a coach. With less than two months to the FIBA World Cup Finals in Manila, I caught up with Mr. 100% just before his appointment as team consultant of the Morocco Bolts. We talked about why he's far from retiring from the team sport that brought him here for good in the Philippines. Yeah. It's good to see you, Norman. Thank you Thank so you. much for joining you're us. You're welcome. Glad you're to be here. You're looking really well. I'm doing okay. Yes. And yeah. how is the fitness uh, not like you, keeping it all together? Well, I work out almost every day. Do I would you? say five to six days a week. Um, I built a gym in my house, so it's very convenient for me. I don't have to go out to go out to the gyms like I used to. So it's just a matter of getting up in the morning and going downstairs and working out before I get my day started. And it adds up. After a while, it starts to add up, the fact that you're, you're trying to stay in shape every day. Is it right? 700 setups a day? Is that what you do? Oh, I'm down to about 400 now. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do 700 before when I was a player, but... Oh, come on, 400 I, sit-ups. I, I've gone, I mean, we could, we I've, I've gone down, down to 100. 400 now. Wow. Yes. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah, but that kind of discipline, I mean, what, what does that give you to start your day? I mean, your days, at least, at least for six days a week, starts with fitness. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm managing players. And these guys make a living by staying in great shape. Uh, as a coach, I've always thought that it would be better for me to set a good example and to look like I'm in condition, even if I'm not in great condition, <laughs> at least look like it so that the players would follow that example and also want to keep themselves in great shape. You're not in great condition with the way you No, look. I am in pretty good condition, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. Yes. So you can still dunk a ball? I can still and, dunk, yeah. I'm and, 65 and, and, years old, but I can still dunk, yes. Oh my gosh, 65. Yes. I, mm -hmm. I was wondering whether, you know, when, when people ask you how, how young you are, I mm -hmm. mean, how do you feel about saying that I'm 65? Uh, I don't really think about it, to be quite <laughs> honest with you. I don't spend too much time with it. But um, it's just a, a routine. You know, it's one thing you gain as a basketball player is you gain routines. You gain being able to go to practice at a certain time to, to get a certain amount done in practice and you get those routines down over the years and I've just kept them as I've gotten older. What was it like, I mean, before the, the PBA Governor's Cup, I mean, your, your trip to the finals, you didn't quite make it with Morocco mm -hmm. Bolts, but what was it like uh, for you to train the team and, and make them win a championship? Well, it always feels good to win. Uh, the difference with, say, business and, say, basketball, particularly professional basketball, is in business, you can be one of the top three or four companies and you feel like you're a great success because you may have 12 companies in your field and you're probably earning a lot of money even though you're not num number one. But in basketball, it's a little bit different, particularly pro professional basketball. It's only number one. Anything less is disappointing. And if you don't win the championship, yeah, if you come in second or third, in our case, we're probably ranked around fifth or sixth if people were to ask how strong is our team. There are 12 teams in the league, but it's still disappointing if you don't win the championship. So everybody else is a loser, in other words. Um, so you have to sit back and try to analyze it. If you're ranked number five or number six in the league and you end up in third place, you end up in second place. Yeah, technically you did have some success. You did, but you're still number two or number three. So you're exactly. still a loser. You still didn't win the championship. So how do you deal with that with the team? I mean, what, what learnings did you gain from getting eliminated uh, on your road to the championship? Well, you continue to try to build. You continue to try to get better. You continue to try to evaluate your weaknesses. And you continue to try to find out how you can strengthen your team, whether it be through personnel, whether it be through training, whether it be through scouting and preparation you have to find ways to get better. The quickest way is probably to get better manpower, you know, get a stronger players, better players, more athletic players who can help you win. But that's not always the easiest way because when you're in a league like the PBA, you can only go through the draft to get players most of the time. And when you go through the draft, you draft depending on how you did the year before. So in our case, um, this year, let's just take this year, we're number eight in the draft because we finished number five in the league. 
this this year as far as our record is concerned. So you can see you're not going to get much better immediately through the draft because you're not getting the first pick in the draft. The first pick in the draft will be the best player. If you get the number eight player, he'll probably be okay, but he won't be as good as the one, two, or th third player being picked. So it's a little bit difficult. In other words, it's the better you do, the harder it is to improve your team. So you're still going to be searching for new talent because you've Always. got a long, Always. long off season to work with, and you've got September for the search for the, it's the rookie player. Well, you can go other routes. You can try to get free agents, which is kind of difficult. You can try to create trades with other teams, where normally in trades you're not going to really get an advantage. It's going to be both teams probably winning in the trades. But <clears throat> I guess the best way would be to just scout very, very well the draft. And hopefully you'll find somebody who will drop to number eight, but will be very talented and he'll be able to help you win games. What do you make of Aaron? I mean, you're coaching your own son. He's one of the, uh, the breakthrough uh, players right now. And he's, he's been very steadfast in his performance so far. He's on his third year as a pro. Yeah, he's actually getting better. It's actually his second year because we didn't play very many conferences during the pandemic. So he's only been there for six conferences now. But you're right, technically it is his third year, and he's getting better. Uh, the one good thing about Aaron is he has great work habits. I mean, you don't really have to tell him to go out and work. So he's really trying to keep himself in great shape. He's really trying to improve on his skills and his weaknesses, and that's what makes you a better player. I mean, if you sit back and you just get relaxed and you don't really start to analyze how you can get better, then you're going to fall behind. And the reason for that is because everybody – is out there trying to get better. And if you're not doing that, then you're going to get left behind. Or there are new talents coming into the league every year. So Aaron has done well. I, I will admit that. And a lot of people say it's because I gave him a chance. But uh, did people you? should understand. Of course did I did, yes. But people should understand that I gave him a chance because I thought he could play. And he's proven me correct. In addition to that, once you enter the basketball court in the PBA, you get exposed you either are good enough or you're not good enough. There's no in-betweens. If you can go out there and perform well and excel, that's really you, Telaga. I mean, if you don't, then you're getting exposed for not being able to compete at this level. But Aaron says, has proven that he can, and I don't see that changing moving forward. I appreciate the honesty there when I asked you whether you gave him the opportunity because there had been criticism that he only got into the draft yeah. mm -hmm. because of you well getting into the draft that may not be true um i, I was told by Raina shine that they were going to pick him on the first round with their third they had three picks in the first round the year that he was drafted and they were going to pick him with their third pick they picked two guards before aaron so they decided to pick a big man with their third pick so aaron fell to me in the draft Raina shine said they were going to pick him in the second round but Raina shine picked one draft pick after i picked so I said, why would I let him go to Rain and Shine? I'll just get him myself. Because Aaron did not really get much playing time his senior year in college, so he wasn't really exposed. But he did play very well in the MPBL. He played very well in the D League, where he averaged a triple-double there. And I worked out with him every single day. So I knew what he could do, considering that I'm training players. I can compare how these players are doing in my practice in the PBA compared to how he's doing in our individual workouts. So I, I thought that he could play in the PBA. And my feeling was, instead of letting him drop the rain and shine, I'll just pick him myself. But then it and was the 18th overall in the correct, draft pick, yes. and, and that would be the lowest in, in history. That would be the lowest in history? That's right. I think or one of the he's lowest. one of the lowest in history to win Rookie of the Year. Mm. I think that's what it is. Yeah. And which he did in 2020. Correct. He did yes. Outstanding mm -hmm. Rookie of the Year. Yes. Mm -hmm. What was that like, uh, that feeling of, of being at one point, being criticized for what you did or did not do, and at the same time, your son delivering? I don't really listen to the criticism. I get criticized <laughs> a lot. I'm used to it already. Uh, whenever you're in a position of um, decision making, you're going to get criticized by somebody. It's going to happen, particularly if you went left and they wanted you to go right. Um, somebody's going to say something. So I don't really listen to that very much. So I wasn't really influenced by what people were saying. I knew the kid could play. That's, you know, I was working out with him every day. Now, he had to prove me right. And that's what he did his first year. And 
it was one of those things where when he won that rookie of the year or the or the the best rookie of that particular year, he was second in statistical points. So it wasn't like it was given to him. He was actually number two in statistical points. I believe Adams was number one. Adams was the first pick in the draft that year. The only problem was Adams' team didn't win a game the whole year. So Aaron got some credit for the fact that Morocco actually played well that year, and we actually did well. And he was a big part of that. You know, he had some big games during his first year. So um, I think that was the reason why he received the award. But he really played well, I have to admit. I mean, we were in the bubble. We were in Pampanga at that time. So we were all together every single day. So we had a chance to see him develop as the league went on. And it wasn't lost on him. I mean, he said in one of the interviews that, uh, you know, said he's getting bad criticism. So I'm wondering how that informed his improvement of his game, knowing that there's just so much criticism out there and he had to prove everybody wrong. Well, criticism is part of our job. Uh, social media has amped up everything in the fact that everybody has a voice now and they can say whatever they want to say and not be responsible for it. Um, they can just say anything. So um, I've found out over the years, a lot of times, um, if you look at the NBA right now, the guy who probably gets the most criticism is the best player in the league, LeBron James. I mean, he just gets attacked over and over and over again. And, it, and Kevin Durant, and well, they spare Curry a little bit, Steph Curry, they don't bother him <laughs> so much. But the best players in the league are the ones who are knocked down a lot by the public. So. It's just part of our jobs. I mean, it's, it's, I'm used to it already, to be quite honest with you. And he's had to get used to it. But at the same time, you look at that, but you look at a lot of people that support him also and are, are pretty happy of the fact that he was able to go out and play well. So it works both ways. And I see that similarity that y you and he played well, but you didn't start that way. I mean, just looking at your, your, when you were in ninth grade, Cardinal Gibbons in, in Baltimore, yeah. Maryland, mm -hmm. you had a coach who said you couldn't dribble the ball. You couldn't do yeah, it. Yeah, I had you a coach make, that said I wasn't cut. good enough, actually. <laughs> At this height, you were 6'5 already? And, and no, said, no, no, no. That, that was the problem. I was, um, that was the ninth grade. I was only about 5'5". Five, five. Wow. And I grew when did you really in grow? one summer from 5'5 five, five to 6 foot. Gosh. And then I decided to try out for the basketball team. But the problem was I had never played basketball before. And that was just Detroit Pistons. No, this, this was when I was in high school. Right. This is in Baltimore. And I had never played the game before. But I could dunk the basketball. I was very athletic. I could run and, and jump. I could outrun everybody and I'll jump everybody. So I felt like that gave me a chance to be on the team. But I had no skills at that particular time. So I did try out. I got cut on my birthday of all days. I cried all the way home on the bus because I knew I had to go to school the next day and everybody was going to tease me for getting cut. And I just decided to work hard during the off season to prove everybody wrong and try to come back and, and make the team the following year. And you did it the following year. And the yes, coach I had did. something yes. to say about what he said about last year, which was totally different. What did he say about the improvements that you made in your play? Um, he didn't really say anything to coach to cut me. He was the head coach of the, of the men's team. My, third, my second year, I actually played on the junior varsity team. So I didn't actually play for him. So in, in high school in the States, you have four years, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. So it was my 10th grade that I actually played on the junior varsity team. But I kept improving. I kept improving. I was a leading scorer and rebounder on the junior varsity team. And it was my last two years that I actually was elevated to the to the men's team or to the varsity team. And that's where I really excelled. Um, ended up being his best player, actually. Right. Uh, that was my high school career. Um, the guy that cut me, Mr. Ray Mullis, ended up being my, my best coach ever um, because he taught me a lot about basketball. And eventually, um, I ended up one of the top players in the state and one of the top players in the city. So I, I really excelled under his tutelage. And that led me to get a scholarship to St. Joseph's University, where I played there for four years. And I did pretty well in, in college. Um, I scored a lot of points, grabbed a lot of rebounds. I eventually made it to the CBA, which is the Continental, Continental Basketball, Basketball Association, Association. Which is now the D League. Which is now the G League, yes. Mm -hmm. The Gatorade 
league. And um, I did well there, too, uh, statistically. Uh, I did really well. And that led to me getting picked up by the Detroit Pistons out of the, the G League or the CBA, which is and where I was And did you think playing. you were going to go pro from then on out? I mean, what were your views? Well, I was still young. Uh, that was only, I was only a year out of college, a year and a half out of college. And I thought that I took the long road my whole career, which was not the, I won't say the easy road, but the long road. And, you know, I didn't make it to high school team right away. I did make it to the college team immediately. Um, and I did well in college immediately, but I didn't make it into the pros right away. Um, so I had to take the long road. The problem was, or not really the problem, but I was invited to play in the Philippines just a year and a half out of college. And when I got here, I couldn't believe how basketball crazy the country was. <laughs> uh, first of all, I didn't know where the Philippines was. I thought it was in South America. And you had to, and I had to look, look it up on a map. Is that right? Yeah, to you find did. out yeah, exactly where it was. <laughs> and then I got excited because... Um, they had the, the bases were here, everybody spoke English, and I had played a short stint in South America when I first got out of college in, um, um, in South America, and nobody spoke English. But hang on, so, Jimmy Mariano, I mean, when he approached you right yeah. at that bench, you were drenched in sweat, just came off the mm -hmm. game, you, you actually said no. Well, I didn't say no exactly. <laughs> I was already invited back to training camp with the Detroit Pistons, mm -hmm. the veterans camp. This was the summer league. Then they had the veterans camp comes after that. So I already had a standing invitation to go back to camp. So that was my whole thing. I wanted to go back to camp to make it to the NBA. I didn't know where the Philippines was. I had no thoughts about the Philippines. So when he asked me, you have to understand how he asked me. The game ended. Mm -hmm. We all were walking on the court. And then he just approached me right as I was walking on the court. And I didn't know him from Adam, so I was like, um, I don't know. I don't think I want to go to the Philippines. I'm going back to Detroit, but can I get your number? And I'll, I'll let you know. That's what I told him. And I went home and did some investigating. One, to see how many people Detroit was going to bring in to camp that I would have to compete with. And that was the year that Isaiah Thomas and Kelly Japuka were coming into the Detroit Pistons team. And they both play similar positions as myself. So I said, oh boy, this is going to be difficult. These guys have guaranteed contracts. I don't have a guaranteed contract. It's going to be like last year. I'm going to finish the, the, uh, the, the preseason of the NBA and I'm going to end up without a job. I'm going back to the CBA. Uh, this guy, J.B. Mariano, is offering me money, guaranteed money. So I started to think about it. I went home, I looked at the encyclopedia, and I learned about the Philippines. Um, I learned about Gloria Diaz because she, she was all I could remember <laughs> at that time because she had just won Miss Universe. Did you get to meet her when and you came here? She actually ended up being my neighbor. Wow. She lived right across the hall from she, me. She's a good neighbor? My, my first year. Yeah, she was. She's very <laughs> kind. She and her family were very kind. And um, I called them back and I asked, told them, hey, I'm, I'm interested in, in coming over. Because I was thinking, I'll just take this guaranteed money, go back to the CBA, and then try to get picked up in the NBA again through the CBA. And then I have at least some money in my pocket, um, some guaranteed money in my pocket. So he told me he had already gotten another player by the name of Lou Massey. Anybody who follows the PBA knows Lou Massey was a great player. I mean, he's just an exceptional player. So I said, okay, I'm just going to go back to camp with the Detroit Pistons, and I'm um, not going to worry about it. I'll see what happens with my, my tryout. And then I got a call a couple weeks later from Teflon, the Teflon Fiber Makers. And uh, Mr. Frank Hahn called me, who was the manager. And he invited me to the same contract to play for, for Teflon. And that's how I ended up in the Philippines. And Get do back. well you did. Um, let yeah, me just work year, yes. on the numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you really did well in the first year and on the succeeding nine years. I've got statistics here from 1980 to 1990. Mm -hmm. You've scored a total of 11,314 points, 5,333 rebounds in 282 games. That's a whole yeah, lot. Yeah, that's a lot of uh, production. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the amazing thing about that was my first year, I think it was about 52 points a game and about 25 rebounds a game. Wow. 
And that was the first time anybody had really averaged that much here for an import. Um, and I really can't explain it. I mean, I was just coming from the Detroit Pistons. I was used to playing against seven footers. And all of a sudden, I was coming into a pre pretty much a 6'5 and under league, 6'6 six, six and under league. Um, and yeah, it's, it was a very productive year for me. Mm. My strength has always been my conditioning. Mm. I've always taken pride in being in better shape than everybody else. And I've never felt as though I was the most talented guy on the court. Maybe the most athletic, but not really the most talented as far as skills was concerned. But I was always in better shape than everybody. And I took pride in that. Uh, I ran track in college, so I was used to getting out and, and, and really uh, working hard on the track and, and getting my body in great shape. And I believe my first year, I probably averaged about 48 minutes a game, which is the most you can play in the wow. game, which is the entire game. Right, but you did have 76. Is that right? That's the most number of points you played. Yes, the, that wasn't was my Magnolia. first year. That came probably wow. against Hinebra, hmm. maybe in my fifth year. Yeah, I remember that game very, very well. That was, um, that was, I was tired <laughs> after the game. Flat out, the next day you were just Yeah, I, bed, I was pretty exhausted. tired after that game, yes. That's a lot of points to score in one game. That's a lot. And that's not yeah. even a lot. Uh, guys have scored much more than that. Um, Carlos Briggs and, and um, there's been a lot of players who have uh, scored a lot more points than 76. But what was it like? It was a 10-year span of like, actively crazily producing a lot of the um the rebounds and and you're you're the you know a record scorer uh for those 10 years what what was that life like that basketball phase in your i career? always say that i thank the fans for that because the one thing i learned very early in my stint in the philippines was the fans were very appreciative of consistency they were not happy when they would come to a game and a player would not play up to par. In other words, they're not going to be happy if you score 30 points one game and you come back and get 10 the next. Because they're expecting a certain level of, of consistency. And the fans seemed to respect the fact that it, it was like, you know, I think uh, Butch Manego, who was um, a re reporter back in those days, he once said it's like putting a VHS in the machine. You see the same thing every time. <laughs> and I think the fans appreciate that. They appreciate when your performance is at a, at a certain level, when your production is a certain level, because that's what they paid their money to come see. Uh, they didn't come see you fail in that particular game. They came to see you give your best. So that was always my thing. I always wanted to make sure I played well. Not so much for the money, not so much for me to be gloating about how many points I scored, but for, I was happy if the fans would just say, uh, see black, Magaling, Magaling shot. Mm -hmm. That would make me happy. I mean, you have a, a certain group of people who are just supporting your team. So uh, they really come out and support you every single game. But it's just the Filipinos are such basketball lovers, and they respect players. They bring it every night. When I say bring it every night, perform every night. It's like um, if you were to go see a singer, um, a great singer, and she was singing in a concert in a big arena, you expect her to be at her best. You expect her to come out and hit all the notes and sing very well. If she doesn't do that, then you're disappointed. You're disappointed in that performance. And that's the way I always took it with the PBA. You know, we have to come out and perform. That's what we're here for. That's why these guys are coming to watch us play. That's why they're paying their hard-earned money. Because a lot of times in the PBA, it's not just the guy who goes to the game. It's the guy plus his wife and his two kids. They bring the whole family right. there. So it's, it's, you know, they're putting out money for that. I mean, transportation, tickets, food, et cetera, et cetera. So you at least want to go out and perform well. You give them their money's worth. Once you establish yourself at a certain level, your team expects that level. I mean, that's what's expected of you already. That's why they say an average. You average 30 points a game. You average 20 points a game. Now, once you start establishing that, that's what's ex expected of you. And you have to live up to that every, every, every game. So... What it takes is you got to get into practice. You got to work hard every day. You got to keep yourself in great shape. You got to eat good food. You got to get your rest. You got to do all the things to be a professional to go out to be able to perform well every single night. And That's your responsibility. How did you get the moniker of uh, Mr. 100 percent? Well, that was an award that I received in 1983. And I think uh, Sean Chambers is the other, only other player to receive that award. And I received that award, I think, because... 
I played against Billy Ray Bates in the championship series. It was CRISPR versus Great Taste. Billy Ray Bates played for CRISPR. And in the semifinals, right before the championship series, I broke my left hand. Was it a hand, not and, a finger? Yeah, I broke it right here. Wow. I broke my, my left hand. And I never stopped playing. You taped it up? I taped it up and oh I kept gosh. playing and I played through the championship series. We lost to CRISPR, but at the end of the um, series, they, they gave me the 100% award because of the fact that they knew my hand was broke. And my performance did not really dip that much. It was pretty much the same. And a lot of people were kind of, you know, how can he do that? But <laughs> um, it's my left hand. So all I would do is just tape it up, Ooh. protect it as much as I could. And since I'm right-handed, I could still shoot. I do remember, though, after I broke my hand, that very next game, I might have shot like 5 for 25. That means I shot horrible. I mean, I just couldn't get it going because I, you know, I was afraid to catch the ball. But then after a while, I got used to the, the pounding of the ball hitting my hand, even though it was broke. And I learned how not to put my hand in the middle of something. And I just used my right hand a lot more. But that was the reason why I received the award, I, I believe, because um, not so much because of my performance, but also my, my performance plus the fact that I played hurt. Right. Um, that playing through injury. I mean, that's, that's the sort of philosophy that I wanted to get into because there are players who would refuse to play through injury. And, of course, they have their reasons. But right now, as you're where you are in your basketball career, if you've done the game as a player mm -hmm. and you're also doing it as a coach, what's your philosophy for, for playing through injury? What do you tell your team? Personally, as a player, yeah. um, as long as I can still run, I'm going to play. I mean, I, I played on a lot of uh, sprained ankles, and the players today will sit out a month for um, but we would just tape it up tight and, sorry, take some medicines and, you know, some Advil or something and go out and play. And then after the game, of course, you're going to be in pain. But like I said, you know, for me, it's always been about the fans. If they pay their money to come see me play, then I'm going to play. If I'm capable of playing, I'm going to play. I'm not going to sit out because of a sprained ankle. Unless the sprained ankle is just really, really bad and I just can't go. I mean, you know, you don't want to go out and get hurt. But it, when I say hurt, I mean something that will keep you out for a long period of time. But today's game, I respect players. When they tell me they can't play because of injury, I respect that. I don't question it. And I don't force them to play. It's as simple as that. I would hope they would take the attitude that I have that if they can play, they'll play. If they tell me, oh, I feel bad, I just can't get out there tonight, then I'm going to respect that. Because the last thing I want to see happen is he's already told me he's hurt. He goes out on the court, he plays, and he makes it worse. And now he's out for six months. I don't want that happening. So you have to trust the players also that they know their bodies and they know whether they can go or not. Is the perspective of a coach also the audience in mind? I mean, you, you had the opportunity uh, to get into coaching by the mid-80s. 1985, you, my first year. Yes. But it wasn't in your plan, was it? You, you weren't really thinking about uh, coaching? Not at all, to be quite honest with you. just wanted to be in the court. I just wanted to play, basically. Uh, I got married in 1984. And in 1984, they set the height limit so that I could not play. It, not that they did it because of me, but the height limit was set so that I could not play. In this, I was too tall, in other words. They set it at 6'3". So, and I'm about 6'4 and a half. And in 85... I was going to start playing for San Miguel again because we, I had just won a championship for San Miguel back in 1982. And I was going to play for them in 85. So I actually went to the office of Mr. Dandine Kawanko 7 a.m. in the morning to see him, thinking that I was going to be re-signed as the import for the team for the coming year. And to my surprise, when I sat down with him, he not only offered me to be the import, he offered me to be the import head coach. So a playing coach. So playing coach, in other wow. words, yes. And mm. I went to his office with just the idea I was going to be the import. I had no clue about coaching. I had never coached a day before in my life. I had never thought about it. I did have a TV show because during that break, that 1984, Mr. Bobong Velez, who was the head of the, um, the vintage uh, coverage at that time, he allowed me to have a Burlington basketball tips show, which is I went around the city 
to a lot of schools, a lot of companies, and I would give clinics to kids and give clinics to the employees, and and just it would come out at halftime of every game. It's called Burlington Basketball Tips. That would probably be the only thing that I would think would give Mr. Kawanko the thought that I might be able to be a coach. And was it? I never asked him. You didn't? No, I did not. <laughs> he trusted I his I just instincts. took the job. I just took the job. Um, yeah, but that was the only thing I had done where people had seen me teaching people basketball. And when I sat down with him that morning, he offered me the coaching job. I was, I was shocked. I mean, I went home and told my wife, I, I, how, I can I, how can I be a coach? I've never coached a day before in my life. What did Benji say? Well, she asked me if, if I thought I could do it. And I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to communicate with my high school coach, my college coach, my, my coach in the CBA, who I was very close to, um, Cassie Russell uh, is his name. And I'm going to start to try to learn their philosophies, what they, you know, what they think about basketball offensively, defensively. And then I was fortunate before I became a head coach that I actually played for two of the greatest coaches ever in the history of the PBA which is Tommy Minotto, mm -hmm. who I played for in 1982, won a championship for him. And the year I won the Mr. 100% Award, I actually played for Baby DeLupin, a great taste. Right. So Seven I, in a row in coll collegiate basketball, hmm? when you won for the Ateneo. That was for Ateneo, Ateneo but this, right. is, this is before. This is when I was still mm. in, in, in the pros in the beginning. Baby DeLupin was my head coach mm. for great taste. And... Those are two of the greatest coaches ever in the PBA. So I had some little bit of history of playing for really good coaches. I also sat down with Mr. Ron Jacobs, Coach Ron Jacobs, who was a coach of the national team at that time. And I would just pick his brain about basketball. And, you know, I just started watching a lot of games. And eventually I started to pick up my own style as a coach. Did you ever think you'd do the Grand Slam for the Beermen? That's a second, Oh, never. You don't think about things like that. It just happens. Um, what do you remember about it? There are a lot of things I remember about it. Um, you know, the year before, we were pretty good. Um, the year before, I actually was a player. Because the Grand Slam year, they once again set the height so I couldn't play. The height was set at 6'3", so I couldn't play. But the year before, I played two conferences where we had won the championships in those two conferences. So we had some momentum going into the Grand Slam year already. And... I was able to recruit really good imports, um, Michael Phelps and uh, Enos Watley, who really helped us. And we ended up playing um, three series that, the first two series, we probably won pretty, not easily, but pretty handily. The third series was a little bit tougher because um, it was the year that Enos, the, the conference Enos Watley came in and we had lost our original import, Keith Smart, to an injury. And Enos Watley came in and helped us. We were very lucky because we picked up Mon Fernandez. Mm. Uh, we picked him up from Pure Foods, and he came in, and it was like a great fit for the team. Not only was he very talented, but he really fit in well as far as his personality and character was concerned. So we just kept winning. And the Grand Slam stands out in my mind because if you win a Grand Slam, and any team that does it, it's, first of all, it's very difficult. But when you win a Grand Slam, you have to win the first conference. You win the first conference, you got to win the second. If you win the second, all the talk is about Grand Slam. And if you don't win the third, the whole year is a disappointment. Mm. It's all a disappointment. Now, what stands out in my mind the most? Well, a typical Norman Black is not all the happy times or the happy things. It's more the fact that when we won the Grand Slam, we didn't even have a party. Why not? Because that was right during the time of the um, political... Oh. Um, problems here in the country and yeah we just didn't have a party it wasn't something we were going to have there, there was a lot of um, things going on uh, politically at that particular time so it was safer not to, to really be out at that time but I do remember we never had a we never had a victory party for the Grand Slam would you want one I mean, looking back. Of course. I would <laughs> want reunion, one because um, be Fernando Poe used to go to all our victory parties. Oh, he did? Yeah, oh. he, was a, he was a spokesman for San Miguel Beer at that mm. time. And he, he would go to all our victory parties, and we would stay up to like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. There was some great times because we had won quite a few championships before that last one. And uh, he would be at all of them. So, yeah, I would have loved to, to attended that party with him again. <laughs>
You mentioned Ramon Fernandez. Yes. I mean, you've coached a lot of the greats in mm -hmm. Philippine basketball uh, legend. How do you actually harness the individual strengths of these players and make them work for the team? Well, make them challenge. can we talk about Mon for a second? Yeah, sure. Because Mon Fernandez and I, we had a lot of battles. Uh, it was one of those things where whenever I played against Toyota, it was, we were normally matched up against each other because we're the same size. He's a little, actually a little bit taller than me. He's more like six five and a half. I'm closer to six five, and we had a few, you know, like hit each other in the, the privates and you know the, the bad things, <laughs> in a chase that call each other names, etc. Then all of a sudden we're teammates, yeah. and. You know, you go from, you know, I'm going to punch this guy to, hey, I, I want to love this guy, you know, because he's my <laughs> teammate now. And I was so happy with Mon because he came in. Mon was a real professional. He came in, and the first thing he said to me was, let's win. Let's win a championship. Let's do whatever we have to do to win. Don't worry about me. I'll blend in. Whatever you want me to do, I'll get it done. And I found out immediately that he was a great player, which... Up to this day, I still think he's the greatest player ever to play in the PBA. Sorry, Jumar, don't get mad at me. <laughs> um, but I think that because he had great work habits. I mean, all those skills that he used to show, they used to give his shots all kinds of elegant shot and, you know, Mr. Uh, El Presidente and all these names he was getting. He practiced those shots. I mean, he really came to work every day. He got things done and he blended in so well with us as far as his character was concerned and and I was so happy with him. And as soon as he came in, we just took off. And we won two championships with me as a player. Then we won the Grand Slam the following year. Then we won a championship the next year. I think we won one championship in the next three years after that. And all of those were with Mon Fernandez. I actually ended up winning nine championships with Mon Fernandez. We did. You became the best of friends? We're still close up to now. I remember at the beginning of this year, we had the opening for the PBA. And he was in the stands. And this year, for some reason, they made the coaches march with the, the, the players and the, and the muses. And I was at the front of the line with the muse. And all of a sudden, I said, Norman, Norman. And I recognized the voice. And I looked in the stands. It was Mon Fernandez. Wow. He was sitting in the stands. So even after all these years, I could still recognize his voice. So that was one man who committed to you. But how do you harness the, the individual strength of, like, like, let's say, another player in order to maximize the sort of the, the game that you design for, for the team and make them a winning team? Yeah, managing players is very, very important. You are a coach. Um, and I'm not just talking about the star players. You have to manage everybody from the first person to the 15th guy on the team. That 15th guy has to feel and understand that he's just as important as the number one guy. And he has to understand that if he gets his job done every day and pushes the number one guy, He's making us a better team. So you have to manage everybody in the team. But it's very important to manage your top people, too, because those are the guys that have to go out and produce for you. Because basketball is all about production. You mentioned all those numbers when you mentioned my name earlier. That's just production. That's what you have to do every single game to give your team a chance to win. And like in my team right now with Morocco, a guy like Chris Newsom would be that guy. You know, he, he would be a guy that I need his production every game. So I have to have a relationship with him. I have to find out what buttons to push to get the best out of him every single game so that he can be consistent in the way he performs. Because whenever a, a, a star player or a top player or a top five player, we call them rotational players, the top 10, because normally you have your starting five, then you have the five that sub in for them. Those are rotational players. Whenever these guys don't perform up to their norm, up to their consistent level, then your team is going to fail. So you've got to be able to manage them to the point that you at least get that average production out of them every game. If you can get even more than that, then you're probably going to win most of, the, most of your games. But um, managing is different. It takes a lot of communications. Uh, I remember I managed a kid by Rabbi Al Husseini in college at Ateneo, who was the MVP of the UAP. And I'll be honest with you, I would come to work every single day in my mind something that I'm going to talk to him about just to keep him engaged. Wow. I would think of something that I'm going to, you know, how's your mother, you know, is your kids okay, you know, can we work on this today? Something I'm going to relate to him every single day so that I can keep his attention and keep him engaged in what um, I was trying to accomplish. So 
you have to you have to learn the personalities. There are some low management guys. I had a, I coached a kid by the name of Chris Chewett at the nail. Super low management. I mean, just put them there and just let them go. You don't have to worry about them anymore. Um, but other guys, you have to manage well. Now you're talking collegiate basketball, and and we're coming yeah. all the way from pro, and then suddenly comes an offer mm -hmm. for you to be a consultant at the Ateneo Blue That's Eagles. right. Yeah. Whatever got into your mind into thinking about taking on coaching duties for well, the I was college with, level? Yeah, I was with Santa Lucia. They did not renew my contract. Uh, we had just won a championship, but I did not get renewed. And that was okay. That's fine. Is that a surprise? Um, yeah, it was somewhat of a surprise because they had never won a championship before. And I remember the manager, Buddy and Granado, telling me, all you got to do is win a championship for me and anything is, you know, um, we'll do anything for you. But in the end, that didn't happen that way. And that was okay, though. Um, I ended up joining um, Mr. June Bernardino. Uh, he had a group of uh, Mr. Sonny Barrios and, and Chito Lizaga and some other guys. They had started um, a group that was into um, Shakey's um, Volleyball League for women. And I joined that. And uh, another guy who was part of that was Ricky Palou. Uh, Ricky Palou was one of the leaders of this, he still is as actually of the um, women's basketball, women's volleyball here in the Philippines. And as it turned out, uh, Coach Sandy was a young coach then, and they thought maybe it would be a good idea to, to broach the idea to MVP, maybe to bring me in just to help Coach Sandy uh, at Ateneo. So I ended up doing that. I ended up joining Coach Sandy as a consultant. Um, uh, coaching and, and at, at the nail can be tough. It, it was that year. He actually did very, very well. And the only problem was Larry Funishera towards ACL that year. And we got off to a great start, but we ended up coming in third place. And then they wanted to replace him. And then MVP asked me if I would be interested in joining. And I said, only if Coach Sandy is part of my coaching staff. Coach Sandy agreed. And we ended up working together. And that's how I be became the coach of the Ateneo. And it didn't take three years. It took three years it for took you three to, years, yes. to, yeah. to achieve the consecutive wins of a five-peat. What were those three years like? It must have oh, been... Oh, that was tough. I was almost going to have the same fate <laughs> as Coach Sandy because, you know, the alumni can be tough They can if you're not winning. Uh, we were winning, but we weren't winning they wanted championships. To get rid of you. Hmm? They wanted to get rid of you. Yeah, that's normally the case. <laughs> Sometimes there's always, you know, some who, um, if you don't perform well right away, you know, they want to replace you immediately. But um, I was lucky. Uh, Father Ben stuck it out with me. He was the president of the, of the um, school at that time. Um, I remember MVP did sit down and have a conversation with me, though, my fourth year. He basically told me that I had to win, um, which was encouraging because he did sit down with me and he was honest with me. And I think the most important thing was what people don't realize is when I took over the team, I didn't really recruit any of those players, even though they were good players. I had, I had L.A. Tenorio. I had Larry Funisher. I had, um, well, Larry had just graduated. He had the ACL. I had Joppet Aguilar. Um, so I did have good players, but I didn't really form that team. So what um, Paulo Trujillo, who was the manager at that time, what we did was we started to recruit all over the country. I mean, we went, we went as far, we went all over Mindanao, we went to the south of the Visayas, we went up north, um, the Baguio, the La Union, we went everywhere to recruit players. And we ended up bringing players in to the team. So by my third year, or my fourth year, most of those players I had recruited. Mm. So these were the guys that I had actually brought in. So things started to come together. Then the fourth year, we had like a, just a great, talented group of guys that came in to go along with our veterans. And that really spelled all the difference. I mean, we started winning all the championships. People don't realize we won a five-peat at Ateneo, but yes, we actually did. won 16 championships during that, that period of time. We won the, um, the Nike, we won the Father Martins, we won the university games, we won the Philippine championships, college championships. Um, we actually won 16 games during that period. I'm sorry, 16 championships, yes. But then the call came for you to go back to the pros. I mean, was this part of the plan? You, you were just doing five, peak, five consecutive wins for the Ateneo Blue Eagles, and then the call comes for you to do the pro. 
go back to the pro and take care of the coaching for talking text yeah that was that was surprising um that happened basically because chuck reyes moved on to become the head coach of the national team um that's how that position opened up uh i had been at Ateneo already for eight years and uh mr uh, um uh, MVP decided to ask me if I would be interested in coaching the talking text team, which I was. I wanted to go back to the, the pros eventually because I had been in the pros since 81, but starting maybe 2002, I wasn't in the pros anymore. So I was actually gone from the pros for about 10 years. And then when he made that offer to me, I, I was very interested in that, getting back to the pros again. So how would you assess yourself then after 40, 42 years of doing the whole lot for the basketball community because you've always said in your interviews that you wanted to uplift the basketball community in what you did and that you hoped that you achieved that kind of uplifting with with the game well i recognize i'm closer to the end than i am the beginning <laughs> i recognize that but at the same time i'm very energetic i'm still in, in good shape so i still want to stay involved in basketball i still want to stay involved in coaching so i'm, I'm not ready to go anywhere yet um but in the end, I'm still hoping that I can finish the way I started. Because I come from a family of teachers. My mother taught in the school system in Baltimore for 38 years. My aunt was a teacher in the school system in Baltimore also for quite a while. So I love teaching. I love teaching. I, I love seeing things get better. I love seeing players develop, etc. So I'm hoping Eventually, I'll get back to how I started. How I started was, I, like I told you, when Mr. Kawanko probably saw me, I was coaching kids for Burlington basketball tips. So somehow, some way, at the end, that's, that's the way I would like to, to go out, you know, still coaching kids and helping them improve their skills. In the meantime, I still love basketball. You know, I still can analyze it well, so I, I still like to get out there and be involved. I like to go to practice every day and watch the guys improve their skills. So, yeah, I'll just stay involved as much as I can for the time being. Yeah, basketball has been my life. I've been very blessed by the good Lord. I mean, I've been blessed by the Filipino people for accepting me here uh, in the Philippines. And I'm so grateful for them uh, I won't say putting up with me for the last 40 <laughs> years, but uh, supporting me over the years. And um, yeah, the Lord has been very, very good over the years. And um, I'm so thankful. I've uh, summed up a couple of quotes here where basketball is life. And I was able to draw up Michael Jordan's who once said, mm -hmm. I've failed over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. And the late Kobe Bryant did say that everything negative, pressure, challenges are all an opportunity for me to rise. And Shaquille O'Neal quoted saying, excellence is not a singular act, but a habit. You are what you repeatedly do. Mm -hmm. What's your own basketball is life quote? I've always believed that whatever you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. I saw why I've always tried to work as hard as I could, not just in coaching, but also in when I was a player, because if you put the effort into it, if you put the hard work into it, it's going to show up. It's not like it's not going to show up, particularly if you're given an opportunity to display what you've learned and what you've uh, improved at. So that's always been my thing, you know, just go out and work as hard as you can. Something's good's going to happen for you. Um, all those quotes that you just mentioned to me are, are really true because I've had failure in my career. Um, I haven't won a championship for Morocco, so in a way that's failure. Um, but at the same time, I continue to work hard. And I always think that I, I always look at it this way. Even if you don't reach your goal, your ultimate goal, you want to overachieve in whatever you're doing. Because in basketball, particularly the PBA, there's only going to be one winner. There's only going to be one champion in the end. So now you're going to have to evaluate yourself and try to figure out, did you live up to your potential? Or did you overachieve? Or did you underachieve? 
And then you have to be responsible for that. And this isn't just basketball, but this life. This is life. This yeah. is life. <laughs> this is life, yeah. Norman Black, thank you so much. It's such a great thank opportunity you, speaking with you and catching up. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invite. Well, catch us again next Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. Manila time on One News. You can also check out the long conversation on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. I'm Kathy Yang, and this is Thought Leaders.